Suzuki, always known for their dependable and reliable SUVs, have entered a more expensive sector of the mid-sized crossover market with this larger and slightly more aspirational across model. If it looks more than a little familiar to you, then that's because it's almost entirely based on a Toyota RAV4, the plug-in version to be specific. But can the Across make its own distinct mark? It's certainly one of the market's most efficient PHEVs. Smaller Japanese makers aren't having an easy time in the European market just at present. So Suzuki's recent move to strengthen its ties with Toyota was a sensible one. And one of the results of that is this mid-sized plug-in SUV, the Across, Suzuki's take on Toyota's RAV4 PHEV. We're going to see more cloned cars of this kind in the future. One's actually already here, the Swace, Suzuki's lightly rebadged version of the Toyota Corolla Sports Tourer. What both of these models have done is to give the brand a shortcut towards the full hybrid engineering it desperately needs to cut its model lineups, average CO2 output in Europe and avoid punitive fines from Brussels. To date, Suzuki's own so-called hybrid engineering has actually been of the mild hybrid sort that can't ever allow independent running on battery power and which therefore has relatively little real-world effect on economy or emissions. It's a very different situation here. WLTP readings suggest that this Across can deliver 282 mpg on the combined cycle, 22 grams per kilometre of CO2 and a 46 mile all electric range. A different world from anything a typical Suzuki customer has ever seen. Not that too many typical Suzuki customers are going to be trading in their Vitaras and S-Cross models for this car, much though they might like to. The Across's hefty asking price of over £45,000 will put pay to that. Still, that kind of sticker figure is, believe it or not, the kind of money you pay for an all-wheel drive PHEV in the mid-size crossover class these days. Though, of course, all this car's closest rivals are more established, having been around longer. Interestingly, that comment doesn't apply to the car this one is based on, the Toyota RAV4 PHEV, a plug-in model actually launched shortly after this Across arrived here in autumn 2020 as part of a model sharing deal that sees Suzuki helping Toyota out in the Indian market by way of return. Both cars offer a pretty good indication of the current state of the art when it comes to plug-in hybrid engineering and both have plenty of competition around this price point. So why choose the Across, a car you probably didn't even know about, let alone include on your shopping list in this sector? That's what we're here to find out. So, a Suzuki like no other we've seen, thanks to quite a lot of help from the company that these days owns 5% of this, the world's eighth largest automotive manufacturer. The facilitating conglomerate in question, the Toyota Motor Corporation, has a favourite strapline for its best-selling crossover model, RAV4, like no other SUV. Well, as we've been saying throughout this film, a RAV4 is exactly like this one. As you discover when you get behind the wheel, take in the Toyota cabin with its Suzuki badges, press the hybrid start button and cruise away in electrified silence. The electrified silence lasts an impressively long time too, we'll get to that shortly, as this Across model is based on the plug-in hybrid RAV4 rather than the more usual self-charging hybrid version. Both types of powertrain use a four-cylinder, two-and-a-half-litre petrol engine mated to an eCVT belt-driven auto gearbox. But with the plug-in setup, the output of both the combustion unit and the front electric motor it's mated to are both boosted to around 180 bhp. That's to compensate for the extra weight of the necessarily much larger 18.1 kilowatt hour battery this PHEV model needs for its impressively long 46 mile all-electric driving range. 
All-wheel drive is mandatory with this powertrain, so there's a second electric motor driving the rear axle and producing a further 54 bhp. Add this output to that being generated up front, and the surprisingly potent 302 bhp total makes this across easily the most powerful car Suzuki's ever sold, and by some margin. Rest of 62 miles an hour is dispatched in just six seconds, about the same as a Golf GTI, but you'll be considerably less excited by a top speed figure that's limited to 112 miles an hour, presumably in deference to the current environmental zeitgeist. These readings, of course, come with the assistance of combustion power. If you stay in all-electric drive, the sprint figure is 10 seconds on the way to 84 miles an hour. Yes, you can choose your preferred method of power delivery. Well, you can after start-up anyway. The car always pulls away in battery-only EV mode, one of the four different powertrain operational settings available. Pressing this button near the gear stick lets you flip between EV and the alternative HV mode, the latter being more realistic for normal driving, as it runs this Suzuki as a regular full hybrid, the software seamlessly blending in either petrol or electric power sources as required. A full press on the same button connects you to a further charge mode, which sees the engine note rise as it rather inefficiently charges the battery when you're driving. Now, all that might sound quite complicated, but driving the Across really isn't. You don't have to make driving mode choices unless you really want to, because an additional Auto EV or HV mode button is also provided, which essentially makes all the decisions for you. Its choices seem effective too, because the advertised 46-mile electric driving range figure turns out to be not beyond the bounds of achievability, which has been a bit of a revelation for us, having spent the last few years testing PHEVs that regularly undershoot their advertised EV range by 35% or more. Bottom line, the technology works, from an efficiency point of view anyway. Where most Toyota Motor Corporation-derived hybrid products tend to struggle, though, is in the way they respond under throttle load. The problem lies in the belt-driven CVT auto transmission this setup must necessarily be mated to, with its arbitrarily placed virtual gear ratios. Even when accelerating quite gently, the gearbox sends the revs soaring without much accompaniment in terms of rapid forward motion. Push your right foot down harder, and much the same thing happens, though with the added bonus of a straining engine note. Initially, this is frustrating, until you realise that a different driving style is required here. You don't make a hybrid engine go quickly by ramming your right foot to the floor, but by backing off the throttle between ratios in a way that lets the revs drop and the engine bite into its torque curve. And once you understand this, things improve, and it gets better still once you realise that the initially rather dead feel you get when pushing on the accelerator can be mitigated by playing with the three-mode driving dial you'll find near the drive system setting buttons we just referenced. Eco, normal and sport mode options are offered, which tweak steering and throttle feel along with gear change response. With the sport mode activated, the 2.5-litre VVTi engine gathers itself together with a bit more enthusiasm, and the speedometer, which displays with green or white themes in the other modes, switches itself into a red-tinged glow. You can't raise your hopes too high in this regard, of course. As usual, with full hybrids, mid-range torque is pretty terrible. Overtakes have to be planned with care because the 227 newton meter figure is about 40% less than the kind of pulling power you'd get from a comparable 2-litre diesel, and the 1,500 kilo brake towing capacity figure is a tonne less. And you'll feel the extra weight of all the PHEV mechanicals in terms of body roll if you start to push on a bit too hard through tighter bends, which you're not likely to want to do because the electric power steering doesn't offer much in terms of driver feedback. But hey, look at what this car can give you. The incredible ability to virtually ignore petrol stations for all but longer journeys. Give it a break. 
In any case, there's lots to like here once you learn to drive this car the way it was designed to be driven. The stiff GAK Toyota chassis provides for a low center of gravity, which helps to offset some of the downsides of this model's extra weight. And bolted to it is a sophisticated double wishbone rear suspension setup, delivering supple damping that copes well with school run speed humps and smooths out all but the nastiest potholes and ruts. Plus, highway cruising speeds are as refined as you'd hope from a hybrid. Wind roar from the rather over large wing mirrors is the only real source of cabin disturbance. We usually finish any review of a mid to larger size four wheel drive SUV with a quick summary of off road ability. Very quick in most cases. Soft roaders of this sort aren't, of course, intended for the Serengeti, and the modest 190 millimeters ground clearance of this one means you'd be very unwise to venture anywhere too arduous with it. To be fair though, on ground that's fairly even, the all-wheel drive eye system in play here performs reasonably, partly because when necessary, it's able to direct more torque to the rear wheels than many mechanical 4x4 systems deliver. That really helps when pulling away on loose, slippery surfaces, at which point the AWD eye system automatically distributes torque according to the tractional needs at each axle. With a front to rear split, it can vary from 100% at the front and zero at the back to up to 20% front and 80% back, depending on the conditions. Equally important is the inclusion of an automatic limited slip differential control called a trail mode and selected via this button between the seats. It deals with the issue that afflicts some less capable four wheel drive crossovers, cars that run the risk of getting stranded if a driven wheel loses contact with the ground on very uneven terrain. Should this happen when trail mode is activated, the free rotating wheel will be braked while drive torque is directed to the grounded wheel. At the same time, throttle control and the transmission shift pattern will be adapted to help the driver keep the vehicle moving. And that's all very reassuring. Should you end up with this Suzuki somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured to in the first place. Not a wise policy because its key off-road stats are distinctly modest. The maximum approach angle is only 17 and a half degrees and the maximum departure angle 20 degrees isn't much better and you'll slither hairily down that kind of slope because this car doesn't get any kind of hill descent control system. None of this will be of much interest to a typical across customer who will be keener to be briefed on the fact that this Suzuki gets the full complement of Toyota's latest camera driven drive and safety features. The pre-collision autonomous braking system is one of those that works at night when the majority of accidents happen and can specifically spot errant cyclists as well as other vehicles and more usual obstacles. Plus, there's dynamic radar cruise control, offering an element of semi-autonomous drive assistance for the kind of highway environment where this car feels most at home as both engine and electrification combine for efficient progress. At which point, you might be excused a smug smile of satisfaction as you cruise alongside the smoky diesel-powered mid-sized SUVs you could have bought for much the same sort of money. Plug-in hybrid tech might have a limited lifespan in all our motoring futures, but right here, right now, especially in this car, it really does seem to make an awful lot of sense. So, here we are with the grandest, most expensive car that Suzuki has ever offered. It certainly feels surprising to come across the company's badge on the bonnet here, partly because this model is so much larger and pricier than anything else the Mark sells, and partly because so much of the bodywork is exactly the same as that of a Toyota RAV4. Here at the side, for instance, it's virtually impossible to tell the two cars apart. Suzuki hasn't even bothered with its own alloy wheel design, the two-tone 19-inch rims being identical to those of this model's Toyota counterpart, except for the badge in the centre. 
Suzuki claims these squared off wheel arches are characteristic of the brand, but to us, they look more Jeep-like. And as with the RAV4, the flanks are dominated by chiseled lines, particularly this prominent crease that flows upward from the front wheel arch and above the door handles before culminating in this angled rear D-pillar. Privacy glass and black roof rails are standard, but you can't have a contrast colour roof like you can on the Toyota. The visual changes that have been made to set the Across apart from its development stablemate are mostly found here at the front, which has much less of a sharky, angular look. The distinct upper and lower grills of a RAV4 are replaced by this one large central appendage, which sits above a more prominent lower silvered skid plate panel. The corner cutouts for the fog lamps are wider and more prominent, while the bespoke bi-beam projector headlamps with their LED daytime running lights are slimmer. All good, though it did mean that the team behind this car ran out of time and budget to make changes here at the back, where differences over what Toyota offers are limited to different badge work. So, as with a RAV4, you get LED tail lamps and a neat roof spoiler with a shark fin style aerial just beyond. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, the stiff, sophisticated Toyota GAK platform that's done so much for the body, rigidity and handling of this design. OK. Let's take a look inside. Getting in is made easier by this relatively low driver's hit point. And at the wheel, well, there'll be a mixture of impressions here. If you don't happen to be familiar with a fifth generation RAV4, you might possibly marvel at how upmarket and classy it feels for a Suzuki before then referencing the near £50,000 sticker price and remembering that it darn well should be. If you do happen to have tried the alternative Toyota, then this cabin won't feel any different because it isn't. You might have expected Suzuki to at least use its own instrument and infotainment screen graphics, but no, you get a Suzuki logo flash up on the binnacle and centre stack screens when they first fire up. And there's a cross branding on the floor mats and the door speakers. Otherwise, though, the only real change here is the badge on the steering wheel through which you view a combination of digital and analog design. That approach is somewhat limiting in terms of screen configurability. This seven inch central display isn't large enough to show anything other than a speedometer with an outer perimeter changing in color depending on the driving mode you've chosen. But it does have a useful center section that can show fuel economy, compass, audio and trip computer readouts. As for the analogue gauges that flank this display, well, there are fuel and battery charge needles on the right and a hybrid system indicator on the left with charge, eco and power sections. Anything the instrument binnacle can't tell you, and much that it can, is covered off by this 9-inch centre dash infotainment touchscreen which has the usual rather lacklustre Toyota graphics. It covers off the usual DAB audio, Bluetooth and online connectivity options, but rather appallingly given the asking figure here, lacks navigation, which can't be specified as an option either. The screen border still has a map shortcut button, which simply reveals a function not available message. Yet another harbinger of the rather hasty nature of this model's development. Suzuki points out that owners can use a navigation app instead, projected onto this screen via the standard Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring. But that's no good if you're out in the sticks and your phone doesn't have a signal. On the plus side, this monitor is nicely situated directly in your sight line at the top of the dash, and we're pleased that it retains the physical knobs that quite a few rivals make you do without. So you're not left trying to stab away at the touchscreen. We also like the fact that there's a neat energy monitor showing you at any given time what's being charged or powered by what. And an incorporated rear view camera is standard fit. 
On the subject of all-round visibility, well, that's helped by the reasonably commanding driving position and the slim front A-pillars. The relatively low belt line, the large side windows and the large, well-positioned door mirrors. Your view rearward still isn't quite perfect, thanks to the thick D-pillars, but that needn't be an issue, as rear parking sensors are, of course, standard. What else? Well, as we said earlier, there's quite a smart cabin ambience. Red stitching for the synthetic leather-trimmed dashboard and the heated steering wheel, plus a decent proliferation of soft-touch surfaces, and this leather gear selector makes a big difference. You've got to like rubberized finishing though, it's everywhere from the door pulls to the ventilation dials, even the audio system volume knob, which is quite nice when you're gripping these things in cold conditions and rather Land Rover like. It also helps that everything seems to be well screwed together and that it's easy to find a comfortable driving position thanks to plenty of adjustment for the wheel and plenty of adaptability built into red striped seats that are fully heated. Talking of the seats, finished in cloth and more synthetic leather, they're reasonably comfortable thanks to eight-way powered adjustability and powered lumbar support. As for cabin practicality, well, there's plenty of it, with most of the receptacles lined by shiny rubber matting. You'll most commonly be chucking small objects into this area in front of the gear stick, which includes a 12-volt port and a USB socket. Another 12-volt socket is provided in this deep-lidded box between the seats, which features this lift-out tray. The glove box feels a bit cheap and isn't very big, but it's lockable and has a useful narrow open shelf just above it. There are no ticket clips in the sun visors, but you do get an overhead sunglasses compartment, a ticket slot with a small cubby just above by the driver's right knee, and averagely sized door bins incorporating bottle holders. Right, let's take a look at the rear. Now, when it comes to space back here, it's important to remember that you get what you don't pay for in the mid-sized SUV segment for PHEV models. Buy a slightly more affordable plug-in crossover model in this sector, like, say, a Jeep Renegade 4XE, a Mercedes GLA 250e, or a BMW X1 xDrive 25e, and there really won't be much room at all in the back, which isn't surprising. Models like those are no lengthier than a compact Focus or Golf hatch. In contrast, if you pay the extra for a mid-sized SUV of this Suzuki's size, it's well over 4.6 metres long, around 190 millimetres longer than a GLA or an X1. It's proper room for a family. And that lower hit point we alluded to earlier, plus a wider opening angle for the doors, makes it easier for parents to lean in and strap down child seats and the like. And once inside, well, we're a little disappointed to find that this bench doesn't slide, but the backrest reclines for greater comfort on longer journeys, and despite the low-ish roofline, headroom's good too, thanks to a metre between the seat base and the roof. And that's thanks to Suzuki's relatively lengthy 2,690mm of wheelbase length, there's also plenty of room for legs and knees. It measures at 720 millimetres with the driver's seat set typically to give the person up front a metre of leg room. There's a little more cabin width than you might expect too, so less chance of a couple of adults digging each other in the ribs. In addition, the notably low transmission tunnel means that it's relatively easy to accommodate a third person should the need arise to. What else? Well, you're looked after with heat for the two outer seating positions, rear vents and twin 2.1 amp USB ports. There are no individual overhead reading lights, but you get this fold down armrest with cup holders, outer ISOFIX child seat attachments and seat back pockets. The door cards have bins only just large enough to hold a small bottle mainly because their integrated speakers are so large. Still, at least these, like those at the front, have a cross branding in case you forgot what you were riding in, which would be entirely understandable. There's no seven-seat option. Few full hybrid SUV models offer that. 
obviously for the kind of money Suzuki's asking here, you could have a mid-sized SUV with three seating rows, but you'd have to do without full hybrid technology to get it, which of course is one of this Suzuki's major selling points. With many PHEVs of this kind though, the need to find room to store the hybrid system batteries severely compromises boot space. Is that the case here? Well, let's see. Now, at first glance, it looks as if the tailgate glass might lift separately, which would be a strong selling point, but unfortunately, it doesn't. You do at least get kick action functionality for this standard powered tailgate, so it can be opened with a swipe of your foot beneath the bumper, should you find yourself approaching the car laden down with bags. Now, you'll be standing clutching your packages for rather a long time as the electrically operated hatch completes its arthritic perambulation upwards to eventually reveal a 490 litre capacity, which is actually very good by mid-sized PHEV crossover class standards. It's 53 litres more than a Volkswagen Tiguan e-hybrid and a full 95 litres more than a Peugeot 3008 hybrid. And as a result, up to eight carry-on suitcases would fit. In an ordinary RAV4, you'd get a useful two-level deck reversible board with space beneath to store the tonneau cover when not in use. Now, you don't get that here because Suzuki's decided, rightly, that an SUV of this size should have a proper-sized spare wheel. One of the two supplied charging cables is coiled in the centre of this, but the other can't also fit in there, so has to flap around in the boot area in this provided bag. And thanks to the way that the backrest angle can be adjusted, positioning the rear seat more vertically can make quite a lot of difference to what you'll be able to carry, particularly when it comes to things like suitcases on airport runs. We are disappointed though that there's neither a ski hatch or the option of a 40-20-40 split for the rear backrest, nor are there any cargo sidewall catches to save you having to stretch across the seat shoulders when it's time to fold everything flat. And when the rear seat is folded, well, there's no fold flat front passenger seat option to allow for the carriage of really long items, so you'll need to be satisfied with a very unremarkable 1,168 litres of total capacity up to the level of the tonneau cover. The area provided here isn't quite flat, but the designers claim that this car can accommodate a 29-inch mountain bike without any wheels having to be removed. There aren't likely to be too many UK customers wanting to buy or lease a mid-sized plug-in all-wheel drive Suzuki SUV at this kind of price. From launch, the sticker figure was just over £45,000. Suzuki only expects to bring in around 350 units in each year, so it's kept things simple here. There are no front-driven or non-plug-in hybrid variants, as you would get with a comparable Toyota RAV4, and no trim options either. Just this single across variant, which comes loaded with almost everything you could reasonably want. Talking of the RAV4, when it comes to rival comparisons, that's the obvious place to start. Like this Suzuki, all RAV4 plugins come with all-wheel drive, and at the time of this test, in spring 2021, the cheapest design spec variant of that Toyota cost from around £46,500. But Across spec is arguably more directly comparable to the RAV4's mid-range level of trim, which at the time of this test cost from just under £47,500. Either way, with this Suzuki, you get a useful saving over what would be an almost identical car. But what about mid-sized SUV rivals from other brands with all-wheel drive and plug-in tech? Well, it'll be interesting to see which model assumes market leadership in the segment for mid-sized plug-in SUVs. Now that the previous sales favourite, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, is no longer being imported. Similarly priced to this Suzuki are Peugeot's 3008 Hybrid 4 and Range Rover Evoque P300e, but are smaller inside than an A-Cross. Closer to what you get here in terms of cabin and boot space is the Land Rover Discovery P300e. 
But that car wouldn't go as far on a single charge as this Suzuki, and the plusher Disco Sport variant you'd need to match the spec of this A-Cross would cost you a few thousand more. We might be more tempted to look at a BMW X3 xDrive 30e or a DS7 Crossback e tents 4x4 as an alternative, but once you've specified one of those to the level of an A-Cross, you'd probably be looking at a £50,000 outlay, at which point you could start thinking about something slightly larger, like an Audi Q5 50 TFSIe or a Volvo XC60 Recharge T6 plug-in hybrid. If we haven't yet mentioned the PHEV mid-sized crossover you've been considering, there's a reason for that. Two main reasons, actually. The first is that the car in question will probably be half a class size or more smaller, like, say, the Volvo XC40 T4 and T5 Recharge all-wheel drive models, or the xDrive 25e versions of BMW's X1 and X2. All these being cars that price in the 38 to 40,000 pound bracket. Even more compact are PHEV crossovers like the Jeep Renegade 4XE, which prices from around 33,000 pounds, and the Renault Capture E-Tech PHEV, which costs from around 30,000 pounds. Those two models ride on small car platforms, so have even less space inside. The other reason a potential customer for this Suzuki might discount other PHEV mid-size crossovers from their calculations would be because they don't come with all-wheel drive. Segment models falling into that category include the MG HS plug-in, which sells from around £30,000, the Ford Cougar PHEV and the Citroen C5 Aircross, which cost from around £35,000, and e-hybrid versions of Volkswagen's Tiguan, the Seat Taraco and the Cupra Formentor, which sell in the £35,000 to £40,000 bracket. As does another contender that might be on your radar, the Mercedes GLA 250e. Enough. Let's say that you've considered all the options and, having done so, decided that there's nothing quite like an A-Cross. Well, once you've reached that point, news of generous levels of standard equipment might be enough to sway you Suzuki's way. So, is that what's provided here? Well, let's see. You get 19-inch alloy wheels, front fog lamps, LED tail lamps and LED projector headlights with automatic activation and a levelling system. Roof rails, rear privacy glass, front and rear parking sensors, rain sensing wipers, a rear spoiler and power folding heated mirrors also make the team sheet. Plus, you get keyless entry, front and rear skid plates, a shark fin style roof antenna, an alarm immobiliser and a powered tailgate with a kick action sensor. Refreshingly, you also get a standard spare wheel, an important SUV feature that many segment rivals make you do without. And unlike some PHEV rivals in this segment, Suzuki doesn't expect you to pay extra for a charging cable able to connect to a domestic three-pin socket. This is one of the two charging cables that come supplied with the car. Driving stuff includes a three-mode driving dial, a trail setting for off-road work, dynamic radar cruise control, a speed limiter, and an auto high beam feature for the headlights that dips them for you at night. On the inside, there's dual zone air conditioning, a three-spoke leather multifunction heated steering wheel, heated front and rear seats with part synthetic leather trim, an eight-way power adjustable driver's seat with lumbar support, an also dimming rear view mirror and reclining rear seats. Media connectivity comes courtesy of a nine-inch multimedia center dash touchscreen display that incorporates a reversing camera, lets you Bluetooth in your smartphone and provides access to a six-speaker DAB stereo system with front tweeters and speed sensing volume control. You might, though, like us, be surprised to find that what it doesn't have is built-in navigation. Now, Suzuki says that the multimedia setup standard Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring system will enable owners to simply project navigational apps onto the centre screen from their smartphones, which is fine until you find yourself driving in an area without smartphone reception. 
There aren't any official Suzuki options, but dealer fit accessories include a cargo partition grid, rubber floor mats, and smarter door sill trim finishes. At least you don't have to pay extra for your choice of paint color, though you don't get too many choices of shade. There are just six, one of which is this test car's sensual red mica finish. What about safety kit? Well, there's plenty of that because all the camera and radar elements you'd get in Toyota's Safety Sense package comes as standard here. Most of the features work via this single lens camera and millimeter wave radar, both embedded at the top of the windscreen into a unit that's been made very compact so as to give the driver a wider field of vision. Well, let's talk you through what's on offer. Well, probably the key inclusion is the pre-collision system with pedestrian detection autonomous braking system, which, unlike some modern setups of this kind, works as well at night or in situations of poor light as it does in the daytime. Those are, after all, the kinds of conditions in which most accidents take place. As you drive, the pre-collision system's radar scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards at speeds of between 0 and 112 miles an hour. Like most autonomous braking systems, this one can detect people, animals, solid objects or other vehicles that might stray into your path. And in daylight hours, at between 6 and 50 miles an hour, it can specifically detect errant bicycles too. If an imminent risk of collision is detected, the PCS or pre-collision system will alert the driver and prepare the brakes for maximum pre-collision brake assist stopping force. If the driver fails to act, autonomous emergency braking will be triggered, which can reduce vehicle speed by up to 25 miles an hour, potentially bringing the car to a stop and avoiding an impact. But that's just one of the camera safety features included here. There are quite a few others. Lane departure alert with steering assist, for instance, which incorporates vehicle sway warning and lets you know if the car is wandering over road markings. If it is, gentle, subtle steering lock will be applied to ease you back to where you ought to be in your lane. Then there's RSA, which is Road Sign Assist, which pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. And we mentioned earlier that automatic high beam setup that dips your headlights for you at night to avoid dazzling oncoming vehicles. One feature we particularly like is this car's dynamic radar cruise control with full speed range package. Mentioned earlier and able to automatically regulate your speed on the highway to maintain a safe gap to the car in front, varying it as necessary to suit speed and congestion. The intelligent bit of this system lies in the way that the windscreen camera can recognise new speed limits on major roads and let the driver adjust their speed to keep within the limits simply by using switches on the steering wheel. So, you need never be caught out by a speed camera again, in theory anyway. There's also an e-call emergency system that will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off. In any modern era product of this kind these days, you also expect the potential for a degree of autonomous driving support, which this Suzuki provides courtesy of this car's standard LTA or Lane Tracing Assist lane centering function. When traveling at speeds above 31 miles an hour, this monitors the line markings on motorways and major routes and applies steering assist to keep the car centered within its lane. This can reduce collision risks and the burden on the driver when making long highway journeys. The lane centering feature is also great for slow or stop and go traffic where it works in concert with the dynamic radar cruise control system to track the path of the vehicle in the lane ahead, maintaining a safe distance and speed and bringing your car to a halt when necessary and moving the Suzuki off seamlessly when traffic flow resumes. This can relieve an A-Cross driver of much of the stress of driving in congested traffic and significantly reduce the risk of common low-speed rear-end collisions. 
We also need to mention two further standard radar-driven features. RCTA, or Rear Cross Traffic Alert, can detect approaching vehicles and warn you as you reverse out of a bay. While the BSM, or Blind Spot Monitor, works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. The A-Cross also gets plenty of more conventional safety kit too. Twin front, side and curtain airbags, for example, plus a further airbag for the driver's knees and ISOFIX child seat mounts on the two outer rear seats. On top of that, there's hill start assist control to prevent the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on steep inclines, plus VSC stability control and the usual ABS braking and traction control systems. You also get a tyre pressure warning system and trailer sway control to prevent snaking when towing. It's always a little annoying, isn't it, when someone gives you a gift and then you subsequently discover that something about it has been held back. And Suzuki's had that experience with both models produced under its current shared agreement with Toyota. Their Swayce hybrid estate can't be had with the preferable larger 2-litre hybrid engine used by its Corolla donor model and, perhaps just as significantly, this across is saddled with a 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger, only half the size of the one fitted to the RAV4 plug-in model it's based on. Which means that the time needed to replenish this car's 14.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, five and a half hours, is nearly twice as long. Otherwise though, the efficiency news here is pretty much all good. You'll certainly come across plenty of people who'll tell you that PHEVs of this kind are mostly much the same, which actually isn't true at all, as you'll discover once you begin to analyse the stats of this Suzuki, shared identically of course with its Toyota RAV4 plug-in cousin. We've already touched on the 46 mile EV driving range in our driving experience section, which is comfortably class leading. The best that most rivals in this class can manage is around 35 miles, and some segment contenders don't even get close to that. Our much pricier long-term Volvo XC60 recharge plug-in model is only rated at 28 miles and never gets close to its stated figure, unlike this Suzuki. Just as impressive is this across model's 22 gram per kilometre CO2 reading. To give you some class perspective, a rival Range Rover Evoque P300e plug-in is twice as smoky at 44 grams per kilometre, and you'll struggle to find an all-wheel drive direct PHEV rival to this car that doesn't record a CO2 reading somewhere in the mid to late 30s. An advantage for this Suzuki, which is significant because this enables it to offer a super low benefiting kind tax liability rating of 6%. Virtually every other key rival is rated at 10%. The officially stated combined cycle fuel readings also difficult to better. 282.4 mpg on the combined cycle, though of course that has no relation to what you're likely to achieve in the real world. Think more like 50 to 60 mpg if you use this car properly, regularly charging it. If you don't, you'll merely be driving around a two-ton petrol-powered 4x4 SUV, which won't be a very efficient form of motoring at all. At higher speeds, you'll need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than normal on the driver assuming a significant degree of restraint. Certainly, for noteworthy levels of frugality in day-to-day -day use with this Suzuki, you'll need to keep the powertrain operating setting in EV mode as often as possible, and frequently twist the three-mode driving dial by the gear stick into its left-hand eco mode which moderates throttle response and engine power output while tweaking the climate control. Plus, you'll also need to keep a very careful eye on the hybrid system indicator that replaces the usual rev counter on the left-hand side of the instrument binnacle, making sure that the needle stays as often as possible in either of the blue charge or green eco zones. 
You can monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy display you'll find on the instrument binnacle screen and more colourfully on the centre console monitor. The sensor dash display also provides graphical trip information and history screen so you can gauge your ongoing success in energy regeneration and fuel economy. The instrument binnacle screen has selectable displays that allow you to see the percentage of driving conducted under full battery power and the number of miles you've covered in either the EV full battery or HV hybrid powertrain settings. There's also an eco zone screen where the car will score your driving for start, cruise and stop efficiency. What else? Well, all the technology in play here might make you worry about this Suzuki hybrid model's reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going. Unfortunately, Suzuki hasn't chosen to match the five-year, 100,000-mile warranty you get on a RAV4. The Across is the brand's usual, unremarkable, three-year, 60,000-mile deal. Nor is there an extended warranty for the hybrid components. Servicing intervals are rather frequent, though, every year or 9,000 miles, whichever comes first. Fixed-price servicing plans are available if you want to spread the cost of maintenance. However you go about paying for maintenance on and across, it shouldn't cost you too much. After all, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, no drive belts to break, a maintenance-free timing chain, no particulate filter to get clogged up with diesel fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT auto gearbox, no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimising tyre wear, and its battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps extend the life of the brake pads, over 60,000 miles of driving. The front pads should only need replacing once, while the rear pads and all discs will probably last the full distance. Despite the extremely high price for a Suzuki, the predicted residual value is class competitive. 40% at three years, or 60,000 miles, an £18,200 retained value. Insurance is rated at Group 39E. At first glance, you might wonder why anyone would pay over £45,000 for a Suzuki SUV. Surely that kind of money would get you something with a premium badge in this segment. But then you start to dig a little deeper. Premium badged. PHEV crossovers with all-wheel drive all cost slightly more, or a lot more once you spec them up to the level of and across. Even comparable volume branded models struggle to match the price and value proposition of this one. This model's clone, the Toyota RAV4 plug-in for instance. Of course, all of this assumes that you actually want all of the things this Suzuki has been engineered by Toyota to deliver if you don't actually need all the advantages of plug-in hybrid tech or won't plug in often enough to use them, then lots of other mid-sized SUVs will satisfy you more sensibly. And if you have decided you want a PHEV crossover, if you don't actually need all-wheel drive with it, then again, you'll want to save hugely over the requested asking price here and get something more suited to your needs. The fact that, unlike most of its rivals, Suzuki can't offer you options in areas like these will enormously restrict the brand's potential impact on this segment. If, though, this Suzuki's virtues hit the spot for you and you're offered the right deal, we wouldn't necessarily dissuade you from Anacross. In fact, there are some things about it we really like. The fact that, unlike most rivals, its claimed 46-mile EV driving range is actually achievable for a start. There's also a lot of kits included for the money, including items that would cost extra or require a pricier trim level with most rivals. Though navigation, which should be standard, is a notable exception here. That's one irritation. There are a couple of others, the rather over lengthy charging time requirement and a rather firm quality of ride. Otherwise though, there's lots to like. 
In summary, the Across is quick, well-built and easy to live with. Plus, it goes further on its battery than nearly all its class rivals. All attributes that might endear you to this car and make you feel able to justify its price tag. We just wish Suzuki's rather individual approach to style and engineering also lay among these attributes. As it is, just about everything that's good about this car is really down to Toyota. Does that matter? Well, if you decide you'd like an Across, then you probably won't think so.